Hello, everyone. So um, as we're waiting for people to join, say hi. Let me know where you're from. I uh, want to know where everybody is watching me from. Are you here in Delaware County? Or are you joining me from somewhere else? And can you hear me? I need to know that you can hear me as well. Haven't done one of these yet, so. Oh, hi, John Diaz. I'm glad you're here. Hello from Delaware. Oh, good. Thank you, Genevieve. Yes, everybody can hear me. Good. I'm going to give it about one more minute and uh, we'll get started on our virtual night hike. There's my mom. Hi, mom. <laughs> All right, well, it's 9.03. I'm going to go ahead and get started. So hello, everyone. I am naturalist Casey, and I work for Preservation Parks. And we are going to be doing a virtual night hike. We're not going to be doing a lot of hiking, but we will be learning about how nocturnal animals survive at night using their senses. So you're welcome to watch and enjoy the fun, but if you'd like to play along, have somebody in your house, uh, grab a mystery item, one thing to touch, and one thing to smell. Make sure no one else sees what you've chosen. You can stick your mystery item for touch in a bag, and you can put your mystery smell item in a little container like this. Um, this is an antique from the late 1900s. It's called a film canister, and I like to put my smell things in here. Uh, you may also want to grab a candle and some matches. We will be doing an activity later for um, our eyes, and you may want a candle and matches. It's not necessary. You can always just go to a dark area inside your house and turn your lights off. So. If everybody is ready, I'm just gonna pull my notes up here. So, did you know that 85% of all animals are active at night? So what do we give the name to those animals? Do you guys know the name of those animals? It's, you didn't know there'd be a quiz, I'm sorry. Let's see if anybody types it in. So the name that we give to those animals is nocturnal. Nocturnal means awake at night. Do you know the name for something that's awake during the day? That one's a little tougher. The word for that is diurnal. And there's also a word for if you're awake at dusk and dawn, and that word, oh, thank you, Lynn. Lynn wrote in nocturnal. Maybe there's a lag in my chat here, uh, but the Oh, I see John Viev and Steve also wrote nocturnal. Great job, guys. Uh, so the word for if you're awake at dawn and dusk is crepuscular. That one's a little weird too, crepuscular. But tonight we're going to be focusing on nocturnal animals that we find here in Ohio. Diurnal, diurnal, we're getting a couple diurnals. Good job, guys. Uh, we're going to focus on Ohio animals and how they navigate the dark using their senses. So what are the five senses? You guys know these ones. We've got touch, smell, sight, hearing, and taste. So we're going to be starting with touch. Think about animals that are awake at night that might use their sense of touch to find food in the dark. The animal I'm thinking of wears a mask. He might eat pet food left on your porches. He might open your sliding screen door and eat jelly donuts off of your countertop. Mom, that just happened to my mom the other day. Uh, it is our friend, the raccoon. And I'm gonna do a, a little bit of sign language. Uh, so the sign for raccoon, you start with a mask and then you pull out to the letter R. So we've got a raccoon. 
So right now, if you have it, it's time for your mystery item. Have your friends and family close their eyes and hold out their hand. You're gonna take your mystery item, you get to see mine, and you're gonna touch it to their hand. Make sure they don't grab and make sure they don't say what the item is because if you have other people in your family, you want them to be able to guess as well. So let everyone touch it and then you can go around and let everyone guess what the item is. And you can see mine here. I've got my friend the pine cone. They're really easy to tell when you touch them. They're very specific, right? You can kind of tell a pine cone. But if you had to rely on touch to find your food, do you think you'd be able to do it? So I'll give you guys a second to do that. While you're doing that, I'm gonna get out a raccoon pelt here. I'm gonna get a drink of water. So this is our friend, the raccoon. There we go. You can see these little paws. They have good hearing, they have excellent night vision, but their extremely sensitive uh, sense of touch is what really sets them apart. They're constantly feeling around and touching everything. You may have heard that raccoons wash their food but what they're actually doing is finding food with their sense of touch. And scientists have actually shown that their sense of touch is more sensitive when their paws are wet. And they especially like to eat creatures that are found in the water, like crayfish, frogs, and fish. All right, so did you guys do your experiment? Did anyone guess what their touch item was? And how do you think you would be able to survive at night with just your sense of touch to be able to find your food? I don't think I'd be able to do that. I don't think, unless, um, I don't know, I developed a super sense for touching pizza, maybe, I'm not sure. All right, so let's move on to our sense of smell. What nocturnal animal can you think of that uses their sense of smell? I'll give you a second. The animal I'm thinking of is usually red or gray here in Ohio. Any guesses? So it's the fox and sign language for fox. You hold up your hand just like this and you go like this on your nose. So this is a fox. And now it's time for your mystery smell item. We wanna see if you can survive. I've got my film canister. I put something scented in here. And just like in your touch experiment, you're going to let everyone smell it first and then have them guess what the smell item is. So take a second and do that. While you finish up doing that, I'm going to keep on talking. John Biev says fox, so great job, John Biev. There are actually two different kinds of fox in Ohio. There is a red fox and a gray fox. So I'm gonna hold up the red fox. Can you tell me how do I know that this is a red fox. How can I identify a red fox? A lot of people think it's because it's red, right? But you identify a red fox because it has black tipped ears and black feet. In Ohio, we also have a gray fox. This is our gray fox here, black paws, great job. So it does not have black ears. It does not have black feet. So this is our gray fox here. And if you only find the skull of a gray fox or a red fox, you can actually tell the difference. There is a part on top of the skull here called the sagittal crest, 
And in a uh, red fox, their scientific name is Volpes vulpes. It starts with a V. And so their sagittal crest here looks like a V. But in a gray fox, their scientific name is, I had to write this out phonetically, Eurocyon cinereorgenteus. It's a long one. But if you check out their sagittal crest, it's the shape of a U, which is what their scientific name starts with. So pretty crazy that they can uh, correlate those things there. So we've got the red fox and, woof, a bug landed on my face, and the gray fox. So you can see the difference in those sagittal crests. But what I really want to show you, and hopefully I can get this right here, if you can look inside its nasal cavity, we're talking about the sense of smell, right? Inside you see all these weird little bony things. They are called turbinates. And they increase the surface area of the olfactory epithelium. That's a big, long, scientific-y thing. What it really means is that there is a greater area for scent molecules to land on inside their nose, leading to a better sense of smell. So do you think that animals have more or humans have more? It's gonna be the animals, especially these foxes who have a really, really amazing sense of smell. So how did your smell test go? Did anybody guess right? What was your smell? I like to put things like cinnamon or uh, we have root beer extract that's really fun to put in there, coffee. You'd be surprised how many adults don't smell, don't get the smell of coffee. All right, let me put these things away. Okay, so we're gonna move on to my favorite activities. And these are our activities on sight. So what animal can you think of that relies on its sight for survival at night? I've got some of them right here. Mm -hmm. We're gonna talk about owls. So owls have amazing eyes. Their eyes are actually tube shaped. I'll sit this guy right in here with me. He's looking a little, little kooky right now. Owls, thank you, Brian. Yep, owls. So they have amazing eyes. Their eyes are actually tube shaped. John Viev, yes, owl. Uh, and they can't move their eyes in their sockets. So we can sit here, we can look up and over and around and down. We can look down our noses without moving our heads, but an owl can't do that because their eyes are actually tube shaped. But if we had the eyes of an owl, if we had amazing eyes like that, our eyes would have to be the size of a grapefruit. Can you imagine walking around with eyes this big in our heads? It is said that you can put a mouse on a football field, light a candle in the middle of the field, of course there's got to be a train, right? Light a candle in the middle of the field and the owl would be able to spot that mouse from anywhere on the field. So because they can't turn their eyes, they do make up for that, for being able to turn their head amazingly far. It's 270 degrees. It's not all the way around like some people think, uh, but it is 270 degrees. So if he started here, he could turn his head all the way around and end up looking that way. And if he started here, he could turn his head all the way around and end up looking that way. So pretty far. Does anyone know how many kinds of owls we can find here in Ohio? How many different kinds? We can actually find eight different species of owl in Ohio. And just like other birds, they can be identified by their call. If you want to try to call owls though, it's best done in the winter during their breeding season. But sometimes you can get one to answer you at other times of the year. But you have to be smart about which owls you play first. 
So we're gonna play the sounds of three different owls. I've got an app on my phone here, the Audubon app was really great for finding bird sounds. The first sound I'm gonna play you actually is not an owl, but it is one that people confuse with owls a lot of times. See if you know who this is. So that is the sound of a morning dove. And so many people will hear that sound and think that they've heard an owl, but that is a morning dove, morning dove. All right. <laughs> Let me move my friend here out of the way. All right, so we're going to listen to the first one, the first actual owl is going to be an Eastern screech owl. It is a pretty small owl here in Ohio. They eat insects, rodents, uh, songbirds, and they can be found throughout the state. Uh, so this is the sound of an Eastern screech owl. If you haven't heard them, it's a pretty interesting call. And the next one we're going to play is a barred owl. I have a barred owl here with me. Let me move my friend the great horn out of the way. Grab my barred owl. All right. I'll pick her up here in just a second. Let me pull up her call. Barred. And so I'm saying barred owl, B-A-R-R-E-D, because they have these stripes or bars across their chest. So this is a barred owl. And humans, we like to put human words to bird sounds because it's easier for us to remember. So does anyone know what the barred owl says or what we say she says? The barred owl says, who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? Are you ready? Can everyone hear that? Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? And you might have also heard these. I've got my uh, natural frog sounds in the background here, which is pretty fun. Um, and then the last one we're going to play is a great horned owl. And we play the great horned last because the great horned is actually a predator of both of these other owls. So if you played him first, the other owls would not show up. So here's our great horned friend again. You can see these ear tufts here. Let me see if I can get them on this side. The ear tufts, these are not their ears. These are just feathers that help to break up their silhouette so that they don't look like an owl in the tree. So let's play the song, The Call of a Great Horned Owl. <coughs> And if you were with me earlier when we played the morning dove, you can see how those can get easily confused. All right, so if you do play that, um, they will you won't get any other owls if you play that great horned first. Uh, great horned owls, they're pretty common here in Ohio. They're throughout the state. They like to eat skunks. They're one of the only known, uh, they are known to regularly kill and eat skunks. It's because they have great hearing, great eyesight, really bad sense of smell. All right, so for my last trick, right, uh, can anyone tell me why do or why did pirates wear eye patches? And we're about to do one of my really favorite tricks. If you have a candle and uh, some way to light the candle, uh, you might want to grab that now. This is one of my super favorite tricks. Um, but somebody tell me why did pirates wear eye patches?
お好きだよ。I don't know if my chat is really laggy or if nobody's answering. <laughs> Why did pirates wear eye patches?、Uh, some of the answers I've gotten from actual live night hikes is that、uh, maybe they lost it in a battle. Maybe their parrot poked it out when the parrot was sitting on their shoulder. That's one of my favorites.、Um, but pirates wore eye patches because they were kind of smart. You know, they were horrible people, but they were kind of smart. So they had a perfectly good to cover up a missing eye, right?、Um, but they had a perfectly good working eye underneath that eye patch. What they were doing is they would have that eye covered up all day long and it would build up night vision. And then, when did pirates attack other ships? They would attack at night. And so they would go onto their ship, the other ship they were attacking, they would blow out all the lanterns and turn off all the lights, and then they would take their eye patch, move it to the eye that's been uncovered the whole time, and they have an eye that can see in the dark. And then they can do their pirate things, right? So we have two types of cells in our eyes they're called rods. And cones. And they're called that because they're shaped like rods and cones. Rods see light and dark, and cones see color. Our cones aren't working very well. I know when we started, you guys could see all kinds of colors here behind me. And now that it's gotten darker out, you can't see the colors very well because our cones are kind of shutting down. But our rods are working to produce a protein called rhodopsin. And it's what gives us that little bit of night vision that we have. It takes about 45 minutes to build up a really good、um, uh, thing of rhodopsin. Ooh, another mosquito, sorry.、Uh, I have a lot of rhodopsin, but it only takes about 10 seconds to dissolve. So think about when you first wake up in the morning, right? You wake up and you turn on the light, and oh, it hurts your eyes, right? Do you make a noise? Ugh. That's because there's a chemical reaction going on in your eye, and that chemical reaction is the dissolving rhodopsin. So, what we're going to do is my very favorite eye experiment. So, everyone's going to cover one eye, and I'm going to tell you a story. So, if you have your candle, this is when you need your candle. Don't light it now, don't turn any lights off. If you're in a dark room in your house, stay right where you are for just a second, right? First of all, you're going to cover your eye. I need both hands to talk, so I'm going to cover my eye with this convenient bandana here. So, cover one eye. If you're using your hand, don't push on your eye like this. Just cover with the palm, but make sure no light gets in there at all. You want to make sure you're protecting that, un, that、um, covered up eye from any light getting in at all. So, I'm going to light a candle here, but I don't think my light is really going to、um, <laughs> come to you over the internet. So, if you have a candle, make sure your eyes covered up and then go ahead and light your candle. If I can get my match to work. There we go.、Uh, if you don't have a candle, go ahead and turn on the lights in whatever room you're in there. And I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to put that down in the grass. I'm going to tell you a story. So, a long time ago, there was a young boy who was about 13. This boy, in his culture, in his village, when they were 13, they were given a task to see if they could become a man. And so he decides it's time to go to his leader of his village and see about getting his task. So he goes to the leader, and the leader says, All right, son, here's what I want you to do. I want you to wait until it's dark, and I want you to go to the river and get me the shell of a great, great, great grandfather snail. Well, the boy knows exactly where those are. He knows the shortest path to get there, and he's going to become a man tomorrow, right? Oh, all these bugs are coming to my flame now. Whoops.、Uh, so, he, let me scroll up here. So he starts walking as soon as it gets dark on the shortest path he knows to the river. And he's walking and he's walking and he feels something under his feet. I'm going to move this so I don't drip wax into my stuff. And he feels something crunching under his feet. Crunch, crunch. And he says, Oh my gosh, those are insects. I really don't want to be walking on these insects. Kind of freaks me out. I'm out of here. And he turns around and he heads back to the village. The next night, He's feeling silly. He's becoming a man. He's not supposed to be afraid of insects, right? 
So he's just going to walk a little faster. He's going to get right past those insects. He'll become a man tonight. He's sure of it. So he's walking, he's walking as soon as it gets dark and he's out on his path and he walks crunch, crunch right over those insects. No problem. And as he's walking, he starts to feel something hitting him all over his body. And he says, those are bats. I don't like bats. I'm out of here. So he runs away from the bats, hitting him all over his body. And he runs crunch, crunch back over those insects, right back to his village. Well, the next night, see, I need two hands, ready? The next night, he's walking, and he decides he's going to run this time down his path. And he runs, crunch, crunch, over those insects and through the bats, hitting him all over his body. And as he turns a corner in the path, there, standing in the middle of the path, is the biggest bear he's ever seen in his entire life. And since he's not crazy, he runs away from the bear and he runs back through the bats, hitting him all over his body. And he runs crunch, crunch, crunch right back over those insects and back to his village. Well, he's pretty disappointed in himself. So he goes to his leader of his village and he says, I am so sorry. I failed. I don't get to become a man. And the leader says, I'm going to give you some advice. What I'd like you to do is wait until the last person has gone to bed wait until the last fire has gone out and wait until you can look in the sky and see more stars than you ever knew existed so the boy he's waiting and he's waiting and he's waiting and finally the last person goes to bed and he's waiting and he's waiting and finally that last fire goes out and he looks in the sky and there were more stars than he had ever seen in his entire life so he decides he's going to take it easy. This is his last shot to go get his shell and to become a man. So he's taking it easy. He's walking and he's walking and he hears that familiar crunch under his feet and he looks and they're shells. They must have put the clam shells from last week's dinner here on the path. Maybe they were trying to line the path with them, but it wasn't insects. It wasn't anything scary. So he's walking and he's walking and he starts to feel those things hitting him all over his body. And it's a grapevine. He was walking through some grapevine. It wasn't bats, but he's not crazy. He knows he saw that bear. So he's walking, he's walking, and he turns that same corner. And there, standing in the middle of the path, is the biggest uprooted sycamore tree he's ever seen in his entire life. It wasn't a bear. It wasn't anything scary. And so he walked out to the river, he got his shell, and he took it back to the village and got to become a man. He did that because he got to let his rhodopsin build up in his eye. And that's what you guys just did. You've destroyed the rhodopsin in this open eye. And so have I. So I hope I don't have to go anywhere here in a second. Uh, what I'm going to have you do, don't do anything yet. But here in a second, you are going to blow out your candles or turn your lights back off. Right? Then you will uncover your eye. And you'll look around with your uncovered eye. And then you can switch your hands back and forth back and forth, and you should be able to see a big difference in the eye that was uncovered and the eye that was covered. So I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna blow out my candle. You guys can blow out your candles or turn on your light, I'm sorry, turn off your lights. And then uncover your eye. And so you can look around, look around, look around, look around. So this eye that I had covered up, everything is so much brighter. Everything is so much more clear. And this one that had been uncovered in my rhodopsin, just that little bit we've built up in the last 30 minutes together, had dissolved. And it's so much darker. And it looks super weird when you look with both eyes, right? So that is one of my favorite experiments. I love doing night hikes. I can't wait until we can get together in person again and we can do an in-person night hike. It is so much different, you guys, when you can be here in person with me and actually get out in those woods in the dark. All of the sounds, all of the sights, all of the bugs in person. It's so much different. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining me. I'm glad we've had so many people come on here live. I love seeing you comment. Amanda, hello, it is me from uh, J doing Johnny Cake with the Girl Scouts. Um, I do miss everybody. I can't wait until we can be uh, together in person again. Hope you had a good time. We'll see you next time.